Father, as we open your word to study this passage this morning, we ask that you would grant us a spirit of wisdom and of revelation, that you would illuminate the scriptures to our understanding, that we might know you and serve you better. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're continuing this morning with where we left off last week in our study of Revelation 20. Uh, and it's particularly thought-provoking because it is the only chapter in the Bible that talks about this thousand-year period that we call the millennium. That's also why it's also uh, why it's the most debated chapter in Revelation, simply because over the centuries, Christians have offered very different explanations about the meaning of all the symbolism that John uses to describe these spiritual realities at the end of the age prior to the second coming. Now, uh, last week we looked at the four main views of, uh, of the millennium uh, with regard to the second coming and where the second coming happens with uh, in relation to the millennium. We looked at dispensational premillennialism and historical premillennialism, which say that Christ comes before the millennium. And then we, uh, we looked at postmillennialism and amillennialism, which says that Christ comes after the millennium. And they define millennium in different ways. Now we illustrated the differences between them by showing you several optical illusions. Remember those? Um, several optical illusions um, by showing you um, that without any context, you could experience firsthand how people can look at exactly the same thing and draw entirely different conclusions. Um, our challenge in understanding all the symbolism in this seventh vignette in Revelation is to be aware of the biblical context in order to avoid slipping into a literalistic interpretation of the details then to apply the basic rules of biblical interpretation so that we can um, so that we can let the text speak for itself in its own context, and then we can draw our conclusions about what it means rather than forcing the text to support our foregone conclusions. Now, this approach is what is actually meant by taking the Bible literally. Uh, so these things uh, are literally symbols. That's how we approach this. Now, in Revelation 20 and 21, there's, there's a lot going on in, in these chapters, and they're loaded with symbolism uh, to describe both the present and future realities. What do we, what, why do we want to avoid, uh, avoid a literalistic interpretation? Well, it's because it forces you to arbitrarily decide what is literal and what is symbolic in order to preserve your particular view of, of the millennium. For example, we've seen that throughout Revelation that all the numbers that are used are all symbolic of, of something. They're not literal numbers. And it's the case here with this chapter. The thousand years is symbolic of, of a very long period of time. It's that time between the first coming and the second coming. It's not a literal thousand years. The dragon is uh, symbolic of Satan. And we know that Satan is not literally a dragon, and the text says that. We know that Satan is not literally a dragon. He's a, a, a created spiritual being. He's a fallen angel. And the angel coming down out of heaven holding the key in the great chain is symbolic of power and authority to bind Satan. Now, you cannot literally bind a spirit with a chain. Okay, so we... we um, take these things as being symbolic. Now, in addition to these symbols, John talks about certain events. There are two resurrections and a second death that he talks about. We also read this morning about Gog and Magog, the, the final battle of Armageddon, the great white throne judgment, and the lake of fire. These are all symbolic um, descriptions of, of realities. Now, it's hard enough to keep this all straight let alone what these symbols represent. So I've put together a chart to illustrate the various details of chapters 20 and 21 as they unfold. Now, when this goes up online, you can take screenshots of, of, of this, um, but I'll put it up for right now. Um, this is based on the understanding that throughout the New Testament, Jesus and the apostles 
consistently spoke of two ages. They spoke of this age and the age to come. Now, this age began with Christ's first coming, and it will end with his second coming and the final judgment on the, on the last day, the day of the Lord. It's one day. Now, that's followed immediately by the age to come, which we'll look at in chapter 21, but um, this is the fulfillment of all God's promises to his people, the, the completion of his plan of redemption, the consummation of his kingdom, and the new heavens and the new earth. Um, now, we've seen this pattern repeated in each of the seven parallel vignettes throughout Revelation. And as I said earlier, our approach has been to follow the text in context according to the basic rules of biblical interpretation to arrive at the most consistent and the least problematic interpretation of John's vision uh, in keeping not only with the book of Revelation, but with the entire scriptures. Now, let me, let me walk you through this, this chart so you have some orientation here. On the far left-hand side, um, you, you will see that uh, there's a gray box at the bottom, the, the present age, which equals this thousand-year symbol uh, that we call the millennium. On the other side is the age to come, and it's separated by the, the final judgment and some things that, that will take place there. Now, Satan was bound at the cross, and this binding is not comprehensive to the extent that sin and evil are completely eliminated from our experience, nor is Satan completely powerless during this age. He continues to wage war against Christ and the church, as we saw back in chapter 12. Now, the binding of Satan is specific to the restriction of his power to deceive the nations. We see that in verse 3. It says specifically, he is bound so that he may not deceive the nations. Now, this binding of, of Satan is, is specific here. Satan is de a defeated foe. He's been disarmed at the cross, but he continues to fight and wage war against the church. Uh, he is powerless to stop the proclamation of the gospel and the advancement of God's kingdom among the nations. The binding of Satan is directly tied to the ongoing success of the Great Commission, where Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And believers have been following this great commission for 2,000 years, and the gospel has spread around the world because Satan has been bound and is not able to stop the spread of the gospel. Now, the, the second thing that uh, in this timeline is believers on earth and believers in heaven have both experienced the first resurrection. The first resurrection is, as we saw last week, it's a spiritual resurrection. It has to do with regeneration and conversion. And we looked at several verses, several passages of Scripture throughout the New Testament last week that shows where regeneration and conversion, the, this, this whole um, experience of being born again, is described in resurrection language. We've gone from death to life. We've been given eternal, eternal life. We as believers are consistently descri described as, as having died with Christ and have been raised to a new life in Christ. We believe that we were spiritually dead uh, in our trespasses and sins, but God raised us up in Christ so that our present, our present reality is that we are possessors of eternal life. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. We, are, we have a new life in Christ in this present age. Now, whether we're still on earth um, or whether we have physically died and gone to heaven, this first resurrection still applies because we possess this gift of salvation. Now, when we die, we go to heaven um, and have experienced this, this first resurrection, both on earth and in heaven, because it's a spiritual resurrection. Now, this first resurrection also implies uh, a second resurrection. 
uh, the bodily resurrection from the grave. The first resurrection is spiritual, that's regeneration. Second resurrection is bodily, it's a physically being raised from the grave. And Jesus clearly describes these two resurrections in John 5, 25 through 29. John 5, 25 through 29, John says, truly, truly, or this is Jesus speaking, truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming, it's kind of prophetic, an hour is coming and is now here. Do you see that? That's present. An hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Now, that's the proclamation of the gospel that results in the spiritually dead being born again. This is this first resurrection of being brought from death to life. Verse 26 says, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Then in verses 28 and 29, he describes the second resurrection, which is the bodily resurrection from the dead, and that takes place at the second coming. Verse 20, 28 says, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming. That's the same terminology he uses previously for the first resurrection, but this is future. First resurrection is present, this one is future. For an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. And those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Now, the difference between what John is writing about in Revelation and what um, he's talking about in the, the Gospel of John is that Revelation is symbolic. Gospel of John is not. Gospel of John is descriptive of what actually happens. And Jesus is describing two resurrections, one spiritual uh, and one bodily. So you see, both believers and unbelievers who have died will experience the second resurrection or the gen general resurrection from the dead. Everyone will be raised to, um, to face the final judgment. We'll talk about that here in just a, just a minute a little further. Um, believers experience the first or spiritual re resurrection at conversion. When, when you prayed to receive Christ, God was already at work in your heart, regenerating your heart, and you received a new heart, you received a new mind, he placed his spirit within you. Um, they, and those people, all of us who are believers, who have experienced this first resurrection, we will experience the second resurrection when Christ returns. Now, in the meantime, we're raised up with Christ and seated with him in the heavenly places. And we experience the first death at the end of this life, and we will uh, not experience a second death. Paul explains this further in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 20 through 26. I, I don't have a slide for this. It's 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 26. He says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, but by a man has come also the resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ, then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Paul is describing the same thing in very plain language what John is seeing in this vision in chapter 20 of Revelation. Well, then at the end of the millennium, Satan is loosed um, to deceive the nations once more. And he gathers them for this last battle that is called the Battle of Armageddon. And he's captured by Jesus and cast into the lake of fire along with the beast and the false prophet, as we saw in chapter 19. 
Now, um, we'll come back to this in, in, in a minute. But then we have the day of the Lord, the, um, the millennium and the battle of Armageddon, which isn't much of a battle. It all ends. Uh, with the second coming of Jesus on the day of, of the Lord. Now we have the second coming and the rapture, the second resurrection and the final judgment that is all uh, wrapped up here. When Christ returns, Satan is captured and cast into the, the lake of fire. And then there's this, the, the final judgment. Now unbelievers experience the first death at the end of this life, but they will also experience a bodily resurrection from the dead when Christ returns for the final judgment. And then they will be thrown into the lake of fire along with death and Hades, uh, which is the, the second death. Now this resurrection is not a resurrection like believers to eternal life. It's a resurrection that gives them a body that will be cast into hell and be tormented for eternity because of the rejection of Christ in their, their lifetime of sins. Um, the final judgment of unbelievers takes place um, during, this, during this period of time. Um, and then after, after the, um, the day of the Lord, after all the judgment is completed, then we go into the, the coming age, the age to come, in chapter 21. And this is the restoration and redemption of all creation, the new heavens and the new earth. And Paul tells us that God's plan of redemption is comprehensive, and it includes the restoration of everything from the original creation that was lost in the fall. Um, in Genesis chapter 3. Uh, his plan unfolds in, in three stages. Now in Romans 8, verses 18 through 23, I don't have a slide for this one either, but it's in Romans 8, verses 18 through 23, uh, he lays out this, this plan. He says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from bondage, from its bondage to corruption, and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the, chain, in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, um, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Now, um, God's plan of redemption in this, in this passage, Paul points out first, the first phase of this redemption is the redemption of our souls. We, are, uh, we receive the first fruits of the Spirit. That's what Paul says here. In Ephesians 1.14, it says that the Holy Spirit is given to us as the guarantee of our inheritance. So the redemption of our souls is, if we go to the Ezekiel passage in Ezekiel 36, says that he has removed the heart of stone from us and given us a living heart of flesh. So we receive a new heart. He has, he has taken away all of our sins. He has given us a new spirit. He's placed his spirit within us. Paul says we're given a new mind, which is the mind of Christ. So we as people spiritually receive a new heart. We are completely transformed at this point. That's the first stage of redemption is the redemption of our souls. The second stage then is the redemption of our bodies, our physical bodies at the second coming when we receive our, glorious, uh, our glorified bodies. 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, 16 says this, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of a trumpet, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That's bodily. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. 
And then the third stage of this plan of redemption is finally the, the redemption of all creation, the new heavens and the new earth. So there, there's two stages here on this chart. There's the, the age, the present age, and the age to come. There's no place in the Bible that suggests that there is a third age, a, a millennial kingdom of literally a thousand years between the second coming and the final judgment and the eternal state. The literalistic uh, premillennial view falls short because it fails to address several obvious difficulties that personally I've found to be insurmountable. Some of these problems are first, premillennialism assumes that there will be unregenerated, unglorified, mortal human beings living in the millennial kingdom when Christ returns to earth and, and rules and reigns here on earth. The question is, where did they come from? Where do mortal human beings come from in the millennial kingdom? How did they survive the total annihilation of all unbelievers at Armageddon? And how do they in, enter the kingdom as, as unbelievers? Difficult questions. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 53, he says, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a, a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For, the perish for this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. So there won't be any unregenerate mortals in the millennial kingdom, if that's the case. Second is that believers who populate the, the millennial kingdom have received their resurrected glorified bodies. You have to ask then, is it possible at the end of the millennium when Satan is unbound for them to once again be deceived and rise up in rebellion against Jesus and then be destroyed? It's a good question. The third is that this then would call for a second Armageddon and a second fall of man at the end of that age. Now, how is it that resurrected, glorified, and redeemed people could end up experiencing the second death and the lake of fire? See, if there are mortals in the kingdom, is there another resurrection, a third resurrection at the end of the millennium of those mortals who died during the millennium? See, these are difficult questions. What happens to them? See, these questions are particularly problematic because if resurrected, glorified people can rebel against Christ after he's reigned on earth for a thousand years, what's to stop them from rebelling at any point in the future, in eternity future? And if it is a possibility, then our salvation is not eternally secure. And that's a problem. How do the premillennialists deal with these problems? They don't. They just, they simply ignore them. So with, with that as background, with that as, as an overview, let's turn to our passage this morning in Revelation uh, it's chapter 20. And we're going to verse uh, 7. We'll be looking at verses 7 through 15 this morning. Revelation 20. Oops. Okay. And then the th and when the thousand years were ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the seas. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. Now, this is another description of the Battle of Armageddon. It's not, Armageddon's not mentioned here, but it is mentioned uh, earlier in chapter 19. Now, as we said, 
The Battle of Armageddon is symbolic of Satan and the world's final assault against Christ and his church. Armageddon is not a literal place. There's no place on the map called Armageddon. Uh, nor is there an actual battle with armies and tanks and, and airplanes. The, the literalists identify the plains of Armageddon as the Jezreel Valley uh, in central Israel. Now, th the ruins of the ancient city of Megiddo is situated on a hill overlooking this, this valley where this battle is supposedly going to take place. Now, remember, this is apocalyptic language. This is all symbolic language. There's no actual place called Armageddon. In fact, the name Armageddon is a mistranslation of Har Megiddo. Har Megiddo, it's two words. And this mistranslation has been uh, carried over from the King James Bible. Har is the word for mountain or hill. And Megiddo means a place of gathering. So Har Megadon or Armageddon is a place of gathering. It's a hill of gathering. Um, who will gather there? Well, it's all the anti-Christian forces um, from uh, around the world that are arrayed in final battle against Christ and his church. This is the final assault of Satan on the church right at the end. In Revelation 916, the number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. And then here in verse 8 in chapter 20, it says that their number was like the sand of the sea. Now, John, again, draws on some Old Testament imagery from Ezekiel 38 and 39 and symbolically identifies this great horde as Gog and Magog. And the church is symbolized by the camp of the saints and the beloved city. Now, in Old Testament, in the Old Testament, Gog is actually a person. He, he was a real person. He's the prince of Magog who waged war against Israel with a vast army and you know, persecuted the, the people of God. And we read about this um, in Ezekiel 38 and 39, but I want to look at Ezekiel 39 verses 1 through 6 here. We read, And you, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and I will turn you about and drive you forward and bring you up from the utmost part, uttermost parts of the earth and lead you against the mountains of Israel. Then I will strike your bow from your left hand and I will make your arrows drop out of your right hand. You shall fall on the mountains of Israel, you, sh you and all your hordes and the peoples who are with you. I will give you to birds of prey and every sort of, and er of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. You shall fall in the open field for I have spoken, declares the Lord God. I will send fire on Magog and on those who dwell securely in the coastlands and they shall know that I am the Lord. Now, this is the imagery that John is drawing from to, um, that he's connecting this vision with prophetically. Verse 10 says that in this battle, and, and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, this is, this is a recapitulation of the scene we see in Revelation um, 19, verses 19 through 21. I'll turn back to that passage. And it says, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped its image. Those two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Now you'll notice that in these passages, no one including Satan, 
the beast and the false prophet survives this last battle. This is the end. Like Paul says, after this, the end it is the end. All the enemies of Christ and his church are completely destroyed. And then comes the final judgment. Verse 11, then I saw a great white horse or a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. This is the complete destruction of the old, of the old creation. Jesus told us that heaven and earth would pass away. And, and this is when that actually takes place. Then comes the final judgment of all the ungodly from the beginning of time up until this moment, the second coming. Verse 12 says, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up its dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the death who were in them, the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Now, the second resurrection um, it, it includes both believers and unbelievers to face the final judgment. Matthew uh, 25, 31 through 34, Jesus describes this, uh, this um, event, not in symbolic language. He says this, he says, when the Son of Man comes, this is uh, Matthew 25, 31. He says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, that he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep and the goats. So there's this general resurrection of everybody who's died and the sheep and the goats are separated, believers and, and unbelievers. And he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That's the, um, that's the reward part of the, of the final judgment for, for believers. Now in Revelation chapter, um, chapter 20, talks about the second death for the unbelievers. Verse 14 says, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now this final judgment, I, I think is kind of confusing in, in, in people's minds. Second resurrection involves both the living and the dead, the spiritually alive, spiritually dead. So everybody is, is raised at this point. Jesus separates them like the sheep from the goats. The, the sheep go into the kingdom, those are, those are believers. And those who are unbelievers face this final judgment according to what's written in these books. You say, well, what about the final judgment for us as believers? Well, the final judgment for you and me as believers has already taken place. It took place at the cross where God moved the final judgment for your sins and my sins forward in time to that moment on the cross when Jesus died. And he poured out all of his wrath on Jesus and he took the full force of that punishment and he died. The wages of sin is death. It was our sins that killed the giver of life. But as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, he had to be God to do this because after all that, he rose from the dead. Death couldn't hold him. That was the final judgment for you and me as believers. So the new covenant now says, your sins and your lawless deeds I will remember no more. There will be no final judgment in heaven where you and I stand before the Lord and he pops in a, you know, a CD of all your life and, and all your secret sins and everything that you've ever done is going to be played uh, you know, on big screen to be viewed by everyone in the universe. That isn't going to happen because your sins and your lawless deeds I will remember no more. It was all paid for at the cross. 
But for unbelievers, that final judgment will take place according to what is written down in these books. Um, these books, um, we don't know, know what they are. Maybe it's the law. You know, everybody's judged according to the law. Paul says, by the works of the flesh, or, or by the, the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. But God is completely fair. You know, let's, let's look at the law and compare it to your life. Have you violated even one part of this law? And just to make sure, they'll, you know, he'll check the book of life to see if that person's name is in there. And it won't be found. And everyone whose name is not found written in that book will be cast into the lake of fire. That, that is the, the final judgment. And then finally, death in Hades itself will be thrown into the lake of fire. So everything that ever existed that is in opposition to God will be gone. No more sin, no more war, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more sickness. It's just eternal joy in the presence of God in a, in a recreated universe, a new heaven and a new earth where we will, we will live with Christ. He will dwell in our midst. See, we still have an open door for the proclamation of the gospel. Satan is still bound, and, we can't, and he cannot stop the nations from believing in Jesus. But that time is running out. You see, two things are imminent. Two things could happen at any time. One is Jesus' return, and the other is your death. But they're both inevitable. One way or the other, you're going to stand before Jesus sooner or later. Now, we just don't know when that day will come, but when it does, there will be no more grace. There will be no more opportunity to plead for God's mercy. The Lord is coming soon, and so is his judgment. And there will be no second chances for unbelievers when that happens. But everyone who believes, everyone whose name is written in the Lamb's book of life will be saved. And over them, the second death has no power. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you for the, the glory of the gospel and the hope that we have in your return, return and the guarantees that you have given us, signed in your blood as a new covenant that establishes a new relationship between us and you, in which you have gracefully, graciously and mercifully said, your sins and your lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Father, we look forward to that day that when we stand before Jesus and see him face to face and hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.